This is The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. One of the issues of great concern to Canadians in this election cycle is how our rights have been eroded by the Harper government over the last nine years. Conservative Party's anti-terror le legislation, Bill C-51, proposes radical changes to Canadian law and for the reinforcement of security capabilities, many of which will seriously be impinged on on the rights of freedoms of Canadians while providing very little in terms of real safety and security. In last week's election debate, only two of the candidates squarely addressed Bill C-51. Let's have a look. Now, when a series of former prime ministers, Supreme Court justices, the top legal experts in the country all concur that Bill C-51 represents a real threat to our rights and freedoms with nothing in return, because there's nothing in there that wasn't already captured by existing legislation, then we have one clear answer to the Canadian voting public. The NDP will repeal Bill C-51. And if you listen to security experts, and I urge anyone watching to go online and find the evidence of Joe Fogarty, who is an MI5 agent from the UK doing liaison intelligence work with Canada, this C-51 Anti-Terrorism Act makes us less safe. It is not confronting terrorism. It is very likely to make us less able to disrupt plots while at the same time eroding our freedoms. And under Joe Fogarty's evidence under oath was that this legislation is dangerous and that when asked by contacts and colleagues in the UK, is there anything Canada is doing that the UK should emulate? He said, absolutely not. They're sitting on a tragedy waiting to happen. The extended clips you saw on Bill C-51 was uh, Thomas McClare for the NDP and Elizabeth May for the Green Party. To discuss the bill, C-51, and the erosions uh, it has on our rights and freedoms, I'm joined by Michael Wan. She's a lawyer and has been the policy director of the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association since 2004. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be here. Thank you. So, Michael, let me begin with you. Uh, f you know, squarely, this is a concern that Canadians are uh, feeling from activists uh, to Im Im immigrants, new immigrants who feel that these, uh, this, this bill will be used uh, in order to curtail their rights. Give me some sense of what your greatest concerns are about this bill. It's very difficult to pinpoint the greatest concern because it's a massive omnibus bill and it's really not anti-terrorism legislation, which many people call it. It is national security legislation, as sweeping as we've seen since 9-11 and really encompasses so many different aspects of national security and redefines what national security is, that in some ways it really is um, not only unprecedented, but introduces entirely new standards in law. So we have grave concerns about the unprecedented amount of information sharing that will be allowed throughout government for purposes of, again, a newly defined notion of what constitutes national security. Um, the no-fly list really modeled on the American model, um, deeply flawed and from a due process perspective, um, absolutely dire. Um, the new CSIS warrants, which again are um, allowing our intelligence gathering entity to um, now conduct, um, well, what used to be called dirty tricks, now called interceptions of various kinds. Um, so a new warrant process that will essentially um, kinesticize uh, CSIS, allowing it to do more than collect information, now get into some kind of kinetic action, grave concerns over that. The new speech offenses that we fear will um, criminalize um, ordinary discussions around political debates because we now have a prohibition against the advocacy of terrorism in general, and nobody knows what that means. Uh, and that's really the, the big pieces, um, smaller pieces also of um, considerable concern. But I think in terms of this omnibus bill, those are the huge components of it that we've been really focused on in our discussion about the dangers um, of this bill to Canadians. How did you think the candidates uh, fared on addressing this particular bill? Well, 
the situation is this bill was introduced by the government, um, and we have a range of responses uh, by the opposition parties, ranging from, uh, well, we think uh, we're not going to vote against it, but we're going to tweak it a little bit. At some point, we're going to introduce some amendments. We would change it if we got into power um, to the question of wholesale repeal. Um, we have taken the position that this bill is not salvageable. Um, if there were something that we could sever that we thought would make us safer, that is proportionate, that is in line with human rights and civil liberties principles and the Constitution, we would say these parts are valid. But there is simply nothing in this bill um, that we can support as the civil liberties organization. So we um, have called for a repeal as well. Uh, Michael, at the uh, end of July, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and CJFE, which is a Canadian journalist for free expression, said they were initiating a charter challenge against uh, sections of Bill C-51. Can you tell us more about that and how it is seriously impinging on our freedom of speech? Sure. Well, um, just to focus a little bit on the freedom of speech element, which is one component of the lawsuit that has um, already been launched, one of what we are convinced will be many, many, many lawsuits on um, C-51. Um, the speech provisions in particular, uh, as I was outlining, have this completely novel standard that we've never seen before. One of the things that people, I think, get confused about when they hear, well, it's not ridiculous that we have some speech offenses in this regard, they may say. Um, what about recruiters? What about hate speech? What about these, these notions? Now, as a civil liberties organization, we're going to be very, very cautious uh, about any um, restrictions, substantive restrictions on speech. Um, but what I think quite often happens is people don't realize that under our current anti-terrorism legislation, how much speech, including um, recruiting, et cetera, is already criminalized. What we're now seeing with C-51 is a bar that has never been lower or indeed vaguer. No one, as I was saying, knows what the new provision actually means, what it encompasses. What we've been told by various parliamentarians and boosters of the bill is, don't worry, we won't use this law to round up, you know, mouthy teens blasting off on their Facebook page. Again, the problem with this kind of uh, apologia for the law is it's legally meaningless. The law is the law, and at the point that we have a provision that is this sweeping, what can be put into that basket is um, unknown and unprecedented. And so the sense of the chill on expression is uh, equally concerning to what might actually result in a prosecution. We know from uh, the complaint that we've just issued, um, we're in hearings right now with uh, CSIS, and their oversight body, CERC, that ordinary um, Aboriginal groups, community groups, environmental groups are having trouble getting people to sign petitions, come out to demonstrations and do those kinds of things because people now understand that they can be scooped into the national security surveillance apparatus simply by expressing their political viewpoints, their legitimate, peaceful, lawful speech. And so this kind of chill, as I say, along with the potential for quite egregious prosecutions, um, is equally concerning to us and really stands to shape how we are how we are allowed to have political discourse in this country if we cannot get this rolled back, repealed or struck down, whichever it may be. And uh, in terms of uh, public participation in this discussion, um, I know that uh, BC uh, Civil Liberties uh, Association is having hearings. Can you tell me a little bit about those hearings and uh, what the public participation in, this, uh, in these hearings are? Well, there's zero public participation in these hearings. Um, what we have, and it really illustrates, I think, what happens when you get into national security Kafka land. We have a complaint uh, that we filed on behalf of many people involved in demonstrating and wanting to appear before the National Energy Board 
to give their views on the Northern Gateway Pipeline. So these are people with environmental concerns, um, land use concerns, uh, clean water concerns, who wanted to present to the board or were making public statements and demonstrating and organizing around those issues. We discovered through a series of means, including media reports, ATIP request, access to information requests, and the um, uh, testimony, if you will, of people who were actually involved and were convinced that they were being photographed and surveyed um, in their church basements, having their meetings, painting their signs, uh, that there was very significant surveillance by CSIS, among others, including the RCMP, of these citizens. And so we lodged a complaint. Now that complaint against CSIS, remembering that CSIS operates on the level of national security, goes to a board, uh, like an administrative board, which is their oversight body called CERC. And they have decided to hold, again, secret hearings because we're talking about national security privilege. So into these hearings, we have a bifurcated process whereby only the people giving testimony and their lawyers are allowed into a um, courtroom that the media isn't even allowed to photograph the people going into that courtroom. And the second half of the hearing will be when CERC hears from CSIS and nobody is allowed in that courtroom. We're not even allowed to know where it's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So we're giving our testimony without hearing the other side at all. And CERC, probably a year or two from now, will come out with some report and will tell us what they make of all of this. But we have no way of testing the other side's um, evidence, if you will. This is the nature of secret hearings and the nature of what national security privilege has done to really um, distress the notion of public accountability and transparency. So in a, in a nutshell, there is zero public participation in this hearing, but we are trying to get out to the public everything that we are allowed to disclose and discuss. And uh, that's very interesting. And how uh, are the people who are presenting uh, called upon and by whom? Well, um, we um, put forward a, a series of um, witnesses to testify at this um, hearing, very special and uh, quite rare hearing um, by CERC. And their feelings uh, about this process, knowing that the very first witness was given a direction not to discuss or disclose anything that had happened within the, um, within the, the um, hearing itself, uh, thus very much uh, chilling them from discussing their own testimony, among other things, uh, that they said, you know, it's like falling in down a black hole. You fall into this hole and you come out and you're effectively gagged um, by this direction. Um, so I think there's been a considerable frustration. Um, that said, it was a public complaint. We gave um, uh, various media interviews and published quite a bit of information about these complaints prior to the witnesses testifying uh, before the direction that would um, very much constrain their speech. Uh, what we have to say about this and what we say the evidence is and the nature of our complaint and everything else is on our website. So to the extent that we have that piece of the story, what we say happened, what we're concerned about, what our ATIP request showed, um, that is available. But what CSIS has to say about it may ultimately never be known. Michael Wanch, he is a lawyer with the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association. I thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.